Now it's working? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sorry. Okay, so yeah, we successfully established the uh, theorem. Okay, uh, so from, uh, from page 13 uh, to 20, uh, these are the actually skipped uh, at the uh, original lecture. So leave it to the um, lecture next week. Uh, sure. Uh, so um, how do you get the last uh, okay. Inside, sorry, uh, is, uh, are we on the slide? Uh, 10. Yep. How do you get the last digit? Sorry, uh, how, how, how do I get? I think uh, that is from here, right? Huh? No? Uh, let me. Uh, I understand that is uh, coming from here. Okay, so the <laughs> equality holds here. So what is different is something inside the uh, expectation. Uh, uh, uh. You know, this is sounds clearly with respect to Z. Uh, uh, uh. So, so here the expectation is actually a set of Z's and you're just averaging them inside. Before you just were sampling a single Z and taking W out, right? So effectively they are equal because uh, averaging them inside or uh, taking just one sample is essentially equal. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, right. So is there any question, other question? Uh, yeah. So like 12. 12, yes. Yes, I don't get how you get the first to the second one. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a difficult time <laughs> yeah, to interpret it. Well, okay. Um, how do I get it? Uh, okay, so let me repeat my interpretation <laughs> and uh, you, you, you double check. Um, so here, so this, uh, this E expectation uh, is um, I understand this uh, ex uh, e expectation is um, what we why it's called uh, stochastic sampling, uh, just you know drawing uh, many many sample and take average of it, right? So okay, so uh, kind of yeah. So here uh, on second line uh, we repeat we do the two different uh, stochastic sampling. One is inside, uh, one is the outside. Right. So inside, what is happening inside is here inside. Okay. So with m samples, yeah, with m samples, uh, just to draw the uh, draw the samples and, and you know, calculate this value and take average of it, empirical average they say, and then repeat it again and again, and then take a log, and you know, repeat the entire process entire operation again and again and then you know we reach okay so then you know take average of it and that is equal to the, the one uh, on the first line so okay so let's think about m is equal to one so that's that must hold okay so in the case of m is equal to one uh, it must hold. So uh, when the, uh, m, m is equal to one, uh, the inside is some, okay. So here, let's call it uh, uh, here. Uh, okay. So because we only have a one sample, so we can ignore the expectation, right? I guess so. P Q, and then take log of it. Over it. Uh, 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 and also the, uh, we can take an uh, expectation of it. Ah, no, no, no. I, I forgot the wrong. <coughs> Here we have a uh, uh, 
M uh, no no not only M but also but um, K samples. Okay, so um, actually, we I think we can compare this value uh, with the uh, first line, uh, the one on the first line. What it says is um, um, either you take an average uh, inside the uh, inside the expectation here, uh, or just you know take a p p over q directory and then take log, it's the, uh, the conclusion, uh, the consequence is the same because we repeat the operation again and again. So the, it's like a two, two stages approach, right? So first, first stage is uh, uh, with, first stage uh, is, uh, yeah, two stages. yeah, well, uh, yeah, first stage is uh, uh, the take average of the K uh, and then uh, second stage is uh, repeat it again and again. Uh, this is just only one stage. You know, uh, we we have the you know, case sample. Uh, yeah, we we have case sample, but we don't use it. Yeah, we just pick up one of them and then take a p over q and take a log and do it again and again. So it, what it claims is uh, it's irrelevant. So 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 yeah. So, yeah, that is my interpretation. Uh, at least. Yeah, I, I agree with him. Because even I, I think one of the things that tried to say during the video is that essentially saying that suppose you have a sample of hundred. I mean, he doesn't say that exactly that way. Then mm -hmm. the standard way is you take all the hundred samples divided by hundred. That's mm -hmm. one way of taking the mean. But you can again sample this in multiple batches, and then you get different means. And you take the mean of those means. That's an unbiased estimate of mm -hmm. the original. And yeah, that's the kind of statement. That you're trying to make. Is that the mean of means is the mean of your yeah it's uh, yeah the comparison is mean yeah because this second part is like you're resampling in different sizes and getting uh -huh. estimates of the means of the original distribution and then you're averaging across mm -hmm. those means mm -hmm. that's the second statement basically yeah so that's m most yeah i also yeah. yeah when i was watching the original video i was a little bit you know it was actually, yeah, yeah. unclear <laughs> so i understand okay asymptotically you know equality holds right you you, you agree I think totally, yeah, it must hold because we have a low, low large number, and we are talking about average mean. So yeah, when we do, when do, when we repeat the operation again and again, infinite times, uh, yeah, they, they must be IID, right? Uh, so that should be the same. So I think totally is hold. I'm not really sure for the finite case, uh, but uh, assume you know our operation is large enough, uh, as as large as like infinity times. Uh, so I think we can take that step. I mean, totally. So that is my understanding. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? Because the original paper, I think uh, they're decomposing it into two parts because of um, what they want to do for the training. It seems like the inner part is just for the mini map, right? So that's why you have. Two two layers, you mean of means, right? You have one for each mini match that you're averaging on. Oh, okay. That's, that's what I get from the other yeah, Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so where was I? Uh, on page um, 21st. Okay. <clears throat> So um, next topic, so uh, we already finished it. So next topic is um, how to improve the uh, variational autoencoder, VAE. And um, uh, when, okay, so the original video uh, it, uh, says um, when the VAE uh, was introduced uh, for the first time, the performance was not really great. So that's why uh, there was a lot of progress uh, made up until now. And the, the way of improving the VAEs are, are, are there are a couple of things. The first uh, couple of approaches, first uh, reduction in the variational gap is it's basically about importance sampling, what we, what we just talked about. And um, yes, second 
I think second item and third items are kind of obvious. I mean, when we have a you know flexible decoder, yeah, it should be you know uh, better. So it should be good. And uh, if, if we have more expressive architecture, yeah, for sure that will help us. So okay, so that is yeah, uh, just big picture of how to improve uh, variational auto encoder. So uh, here, uh, this this slide is about to uh, uh, think, uh, yeah reduction uh, of uh, variational. Gap. So here, uh, what does mean? Uh, what does uh, variational gap means? Uh, it means mismatch between approximate posterior and true posterior, and how to reduce the gap, the mismatch. Uh, we have an important sampling. So here, uh, uh, abbreviated as an IWAE. Uh, sorry, as a importance. Uh, importance weighted auto encoder is here abbreviated as IWAE. And now uh, we also are yeah, uh, going to talk about more expressive uh, approximate posterior and more expressive prior. So here uh, it's kind of just recap, uh, as we talked about. Um, the first, I, uh, okay, so as we just saw uh, with some more uh, samples, case samples, we have um, uh, approximate posterior closer to the true posterior, and uh, clearly, consequently, the uh, lower bound L sub k uh, is um, closer uh, to the log of p of x. Yeah, that is yeah, straightforward. So let's check it. Uh, how much uh, is it helpful uh, by looking at some example of MNIST? So here, uh, the data is MNIST. Um, the idea is uh, here we have a, uh, we have a data and let's divide it into the training data set and the validation, uh, validation data set and yeah clearly you know, train the model or with the training data set and we have a fitted model trained model and put the validation set into the fitted model and then we can calculate uh, the likelihood and then clearly our uh, you know, likelihood is you know, the better uh, the better, the higher the likelihood, the better fitting the model is. So here, um, NLL it's a, it stands for the negative uh, log likelihood is reported. That is the, uh, the criteria to measure the goodness of the model. So here, the, on the left hand side is a variational auto encoder. So and the, on the right hand side, uh, importance weighted auto encoder order is reported. Um, to be precise, we cannot, we don't have an, any access to the log, uh, sorry, negative log likelihood. So here, uh, instead of um, NLL, uh, the variational lower bound is reported. And here, what is reported is uh, L sub k. So, okay. so in the case, uh, of k is equal to one on the first row, you know, it's it's identical, not nothing different. So that's why the performance is exactly the same. So the difference happens uh, for the second row when uh, when we have a k is equal to five, uh, five samples. Uh, they clearly uh, the performance is better for the IWAE. So actually, uh, I was once yeah when I saw it for the first time, I was confused uh, by this. What does it, what, what does k is equal to five mean for the VAE? Um, I interpret, uh, so, okay, so here we have uh, uh, k samples, but uh, we don't use k samples. We only use one of them. And then uh, through, uh, in the other words, just you know, threw away uh, four samples and only use, randomly picked uh, one sample is used to evaluate uh, variational lower bound. So that's why it does not very change. Uh, whereas for the importance weighted uh, auto encoder, we take average. We take average. So in a way, uh, the the difference between the two is some benefit from taking average. So yeah, it's nicely highlight you know, how we improved uh, moving from VAE to the IWAE. And the difference is clear uh, for the case. In the case, k is equal to. 50. Uh, can you explain what's the exact difference between the 
Sure, sure. Okay, so VAE. I think I'll be helpful. Oh, yeah, in short, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, yeah, very simple one, right? And yeah, and this is uh, L sub K. I don't know. This one, L sub K. So difference is, you know, here K divided by K, nothing here. So it's just a tighter bound. Is it like affecting the algorithm or just like how would a generator model it because of the tighter bound? Ah, I think yeah. The original lecture just men mentioned tighter bound. So at least we have we can achieve tighter bound. Yeah. I'll be doing question mark beyond that. So <laughs> okay. All right. So okay. yeah, I if, I think um that's it. Ah, so yeah. The one thing, one thing to note is I'm not really sure what this means. <laughs> Active units and the original lecture it was skipped. So I don't know what this means, but uh, yeah, maybe the better, the higher number it is, the better it is. I don't know, but uh, yeah, because either way, the network seems more active. So <laughs> it's in the original paper. So those of you who have the original paper from Slack, you guys can check that. I'm going to read it now to see whether that is uh, discussed. It's on page six, I think, or seven. That's actually on the bottom of page seven. Based on this intuition, we measure the activity of a latent U covariance uh, between uh, U and Q. Okay, covariance between U and Q. Anyways, it's, yeah, it's not present on the slide, so you can go look at the, the original paper, uh, section five point two. Okay. Uh, general channel. So um, a little bit earlier at 6.22 p.m. I said this is the original paper. Uh, so you can take a look at it. It's from archive, of course, where else would you find it? Um, so uh, if you go to that archive link and go to page seven, you will find it at the bottom. It's talking about um, active units. I don't know how important it is, but uh, you guys can try to describe it. Um, of course, if the number is bigger, then it's probably a good thing. If the number is smaller, it's probably a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they do say a little bit about it in, during uh, page eight, right? They say, um, interestingly, in the two-layer model, the second layer uses very little modeling capacity. Um, we speculate that a larger number of active dimensions represents a richer matrix. But it doesn't seem to be doing much, right? But then that negative bump likelihood number is quite similar. Yeah. So I guess, um, are we going to discuss it or something done? Yeah, do you, do you have any other parts you want to go through? Uh, actually, this is my last uh, yeah, slide. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So. Okay.
So those of you on remote, we actually have a Bluetooth speaker. So if you want to talk uh, or raise questions, just go ahead and uh, shout out when you're ready.
That's why I struggle with the math. I, I, my math is no good, but uh, your, your math is probably better than mine. Okay, the point is, uh, for this, uh, what you do is, um, okay, if you don't know how to use this, this is, okay. So uh, you annotate just like this, okay, you can change color. Okay. Um, you erase here. If you want to erase a lot of text, you go to bookmark, clear everything, and then close bookmark. If you change the yeah, change slide left oh, just right. Like, yeah, slide like that. Can, can I open lecture two B? Yeah, sure. Lecture two B. Uh, if you go get it. Lecture two B. Lecture two B. This one. All right. This is the one. Yeah. Okay. So go all the way back. Thank you for that. Yeah, we can that. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Which slide do you want to start with? Uh, 18. 18. Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay. 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 So I think uh, some of the previous lectures may have gone over some of this. So just just gauge the interest from the audience. What you want to cover. Are you doing bits back or you're still doing? Okay. I don't know. Okay, no worries. Yeah, everyone's responsible for just a tiny bit. Otherwise, it's too much. Let everyone know that. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. Hi, so yeah, so we're gonna get started on the lecture 4B for B spec coding. Hi everyone, uh so those at the back, can you hear can you hear me? Is this clear enough? Okay, okay, so so we're gonna go bit spec coding. So the idea is idea for bit spec coding is trying to get the bits back after you in a way like after you send it, how to get the bits back. So I think we'll just go through uh, some of the topics here. Okay, uh, references we can offer. So, uh, in terms of refresher for the previous, uh, because these are important information uh, for the, the lecture, this part, right? So the first one is that, um, oh, before, before I go through this, right? So the idea is, let's say you want to send, you want to send uh, information over from one person to another. So let's say I want to send information over to anyone here. Uh, I want to preferably not send the whole information. So I want to do a compression of it. So the idea is here is how can we do a compression to send as little information over? So in the first in the first case, right, there was a theorem said by Shannon that says that eh, what do I draw? Okay. Yeah, said by Shannon, right, that that any compression scheme right has to have at least this much, which is the entropy. So this is the this is the gold standard, like the best the, the best case you can get. So we're trying to we're trying to get something that approximates this. Um then the other theory that was proposed, right, was that we can, we can get close to it by the entropy plus one. So if anyone, just to drop people's memory, the idea is that we can combine, we can combine the, those that have the lowest probabilities. Okay, can't draw here. Okay. We can combine the ones with the lowest probabilities and then do an encoding for, for those. So that one is these two. And then we can, we can slowly add up, add up, add up, right, to make sure that we have the full encoded list, and then this should be one of the uh, optimal ways, close to optimal, close to the gold standard that we can get. But people have also seen that 
if I do plus one, right, every time I want to send that piece of information over, right, I will have encode, I will uh, be penalized with the plus one. So the idea is, can I combine all of them into one single batch? So that I, instead of sending one, I send a chunk of them. So the idea is that yeah, so instead of sending instead of sending this whole this whole thing, uh, instead of sending A, then sending A, then sending B, then sending A, I send all of it together by encoding it on one interval. So that's the idea of what is the basics for this first. This first, second, and third. Right. Okay, so everyone understand roughly this part. Okay. So but the problem is that. Uh, the problem is that when we look at the first few cases, like like this one, um, and the and the Huffman coding, right? They have they have innumerable in, innumerable axes, meaning that is all we can count them. There's like x like ten. There's not infinite amount of them. So, uh, the question is, what what happens if we want to send uh things with higher uh, decimal places or things that are more uh, are more large? So, example, if it's continuous. Or if it's higher dimensional, we cannot use we cannot just straight away use the half man encoding or the or the AC method because uh you have too many maybe like we try to construct the tree and then the tree breaks down because there's too many for us to uh send over. So the question is how can we uh cross over this and fix these issues? Yeah. So for the for the first one right for the continuous one, the prof basically says that we can we can what we can do is we can discretize it, meaning that. Um, instead of sending, in, instead of sending every everything to the correct precision, we send a estimated amount. So he gives one example, uh, with a CDF. So previously we've known that you can use a CDF uh, to to map something to another thing, right? So we can essentially say that uh, everything, if, and if we take this, and we take this axis here, right, this axis only ranges from zero to one. So we can actually split this up into like finite uh, uniform sections. So if I split it into let's say five sections. Oh, why did I erase? Okay. If I split it into five sections, then I can say that each section is one code word. And then this section correlates to everything along this axis. So any anything on this uh, anything on this line here, I can I can just correlate to one code word and then send that one code word. Then is I basically discretized it for that. And then uh, the prof goes on to say that we lose some precision by doing the discretization, and then he calculates the entropy based on that. So there is this section here, right? But the basic idea is that we can essentially, if it's if it's a if it's a if it's a continuous number, we can discretize this and send the discretized version of it. And and if we break it into more sets, then the discretized version becomes closer to the actual actual version. Yep. Okay. So, um, but what happens if it's not only continuous, but it's many, many dimensions, meaning many, many, uh, yeah, many, many dimensions. So what can we do? So um, he brings upon this idea that um, if we can encode this high dimensional thing with something else, that is, uh, and then we can use that to send over the information. So. I think what he's mentioning is um, as the example that he gives right is to use uh, multiple gaussians to to encode the first case yes uh, yeah wait so okay so 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 he draws he wait where is it here oh yeah so he draws basically he's trying to say that in this case right we can use a mixture to encode many many different distributions that the original uh, uh, distribution cannot encode by itself. Uh. So he draws this example here that is a lot of squeaky, squeaky lines and then he says that okay we can actually encode the information in with a summation of many many small Gaussians. So that's basically the idea. So instead of uh, instead of trying to send this whole thing you try to encode this thing into the smaller Gaussians and send the encoded version of the original X with the Gaussians instead. Everyone roughly get the idea. Okay, roughly, okay. Yep. 
Okay, then he mentions that uh, when I want to send it over, right, how is, what is the actual uh, process in sending information over? So he mentions three possible cases. Uh, in the first case, he says that you choose after, after, you have, after you have your multiple Gaussians and you, you know you, you want to send a certain x, x value. So the x value can maybe be one of the values here. Or maybe this one. I think this one is easier. So if you want to send, if you want to send a value here, right, on this, this value here, right, you first choose the Gaussian that maximizes that. And then you send over this the information for the Gaussian. And then after that, you send over the, the encoder version of X with this Gaussian. Right. Then, uh, okay, so that's this part. Then he asks, you, then he asks whether this is an optimal case for sending information over. Uh, but his answer is that no. And why is it not, why is it not um, optimal case? It's because when you choose the maximum, let's say you have X. Let's say your X is here. If I chose the maximum, this will probably be my this will be my eye that I want to send over. But because I send over this eye, I lose some information in between the maximum that the Gaussian can can encode versus the actual case that can be encoded. So therefore, uh, it's not efficient. Yeah, so that's the, that's the first case. So you're saying that if it's not efficient to send it this way, is there another way to send it? So the other way is to say, can we send it versus, instead of sending it this way, can we do sampling? So, sorry, so by, so by sampling, instead of choosing the, instead of choosing the, the eye that is maximized, can I sample the, all the pos, uh, into a few possible eyes? And most often than not, you will get the same eye, but not, it's not always true. Uh, Yeah. Then after that you do after you sample, you send the I over and then you send the X encoded with I. Uh then he asks the same question, so whether is this optimal or not? Then his answer is basically uh it is not optimal because you are sending you're sending more information than we require and that uh it's also not as optimal as the previous case because um he be saying that um, so let's say, I think, I suppose if we sample, if we sample this X, this is probably the X that best, uh, this is probably the X that best uh, can encode, sorry, the I that best can encode X. But the next one that is best, right, would be this one. So if we use the other one here, right, then probably we'll get this value here. Then we will, so I suppose, He's saying that um, not choosing the maximum one, not choosing the maximum one means that you lose more information when you send it over. And it's not the most optimal way to encode. Yeah, then he goes on to the third case, which is which is the whole point of this uh, lecture, which is the big spec coding portion. So he's saying that actually, actually when you had send, cause so we send I and we send X. But there, when you send I and send X, there is a unique, there's only one way to, uh, how do I say this? Uh, He says he knows pi given x to x to the and then he says why the cost is pi and not pi given x because recipient doesn't have x. How does the recipient know pi given x? Oh, so he doesn't. He doesn't know. He doesn't know pi given x. He doesn't know. Okay. The next slide. So he knows pi given x because pi x plus knows pi given x. I 
Oh yes, okay. Sorry, so so back to the back to the first case, right? We we don't know so like like we have if we have a lot of the original px here, right, and we we don't know what is the un actual underlying Gaussian. We don't we don't know for sure. So we don't know what is p i given x. But what he's saying is that we can um as in we can estimate we can estimate what we think it is. So we try to estimate a version of it. And then we take this version and then we sample, we sample the value of i from here. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, he, he doesn't know that. So he doesn't the know. Like, uh, say that actually we does not we approximate the value of the place of the yeah. For here we're just using the simple answer. So can I verify? So it says yeah. that you know P of I given X, but actually you only have a certain yeah. right? You have an approximation of it in Q, which is um, slowly calculate the previous transformation. So the whole idea is if you knew P of I given X, then you should do all these things to work right. Construct the relatives because you know where your X is and I have all the information. What else is this? This is the slide. I can read the lecture. He says that this slide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's actually exactly yeah. So he explains first how to do the things and all of this. And two slides later, when he says back, this back for him with possible inference, that's where you, that's where he explains how to use the tube to make the Oh. So, so yeah, that's very nice. Okay. So okay. So this is saying that. Then the second point, the yeah. send i cost is log of one by p i. Is that still the cost, or if you should like you know q i given x? What should be the true cost of actually sending? So I guess we'll get to that. Give an we'll get to that on I guess the third slide. This is the one where you get syntax conversion, right? So there's no change. Yeah, I don't know. think it changes syntax. Oh, so it doesn't. Okay, it's <laughs> finished one. So when you go to the yeah. yeah. So now it's Q, QI, right? I mean, yeah. Yes, 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 it will be considered, but the sending of I cost is still log of 1 by PI. Okay. PI is the prior factor. Okay, the prior of the other, but the center of the. Question of Q, I given X should be a better estimate than I. And so, as, as such, one by Q, I given X should be a better estimate. What is the cost? What is the one by P, I? 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so yeah, so if you're on the Spark team or looking out, maybe you guys can go go figure that part. Yeah. Okay. So so moving on, right? Uh, he mentions that we can we can also have the information of the random bits being sent over without actually sending o sending the information over because we send we send i and x and using that it can construct i suppose from there you can construct which um which 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 thing was used to send so if if the um yeah which which sorry i think I think it was this one. If he if he picks one of this area and then he chooses an X, then which X it will be and which I is likely to be the case that is sampled from. So you can send this uh three pieces of information. Whereas he as in he sends over I and X, he doesn't actually send over the random bits, but the random bits can be reconstructed. So that's the basic idea. Uh based on I and X and the uh yeah. So he's saying that this information is the random bits that comes out on the other side. That is not actually sent, but is reconstructed. So therefore, uh, therefore he has this term over here, which is the cost involved with the not sending the random bits, but having information appear on the other side. Yeah. Then um. He mentioned that this is the evidence lower bound from the other case, which honestly I'm not too sure how I'm not too sure about uh, that part. Yeah, but in the in the in the previous slide, right, he shows that if this is the if this is the cost of sending information, we can move the terms around to create it to be like this, and then if we and then the basically uh, the terms will cancel out, and then it becomes this term. So if it becomes this term, right, then we look at the original, the first the Shannon's uh, theorem, right. So that means that we've actually cost like block X, we've actually sent the most optimal case. So if you had wanted to send those three pieces of information, this would be the optimal way to send the information over <coughs> by sending actually two and having the person reconstruct the third piece of information. How important is this is the proof for that evidence lower bound? Because if instead of Q, uh, instead of using the approximate if yeah. you use the exact information. To recover the evidence here in this one. Oh, okay. Right? Mm. That's the other one, right? So if you go yeah. back there, so that's the approximation to this evidence. Yeah. That's why it's the norm. Oh, okay. Because if you instead of Q, if you put P, you recover the evidence one by P. Oh, okay. Okay. Then, um, then in the next slide, he gives us an example of exactly how it will be run in practice. So he's saying that, but you have to, in this assumption here, you say that we do have random data that we want to transmit. So it only works when there's, when there's other additional information we want to transmit. So here is this additional random information. And then you can take a chunk of it to sample. And then you can you can take, I suppose he's saying like you can take this chunk to sample. I'm not too sure about that. Uh, but if you take this chunk and then you sample, then you can remove the cost of this chunk. And then you add back the encoded version. Uh, if I remember correctly, he's saying that this this should be X and then this should be Y, I, this should be I. So therefore, is if I, if I remove the sampling, uh, I suppose this is either q i given or sorry p i given x. Then you remove this information that is that can be recovered at the other side. Then you send over you in, include the x 
information and then you click the I information. So then this becomes the first chunk that you can send over. And then he mentioned how you can actually use this uh, this portion again to redo the uh, to redo the next piece of information that you want to send over. So therefore, uh, in this, I think, you not here? No, I don't think we have it. So therefore, he shows like we can, is every side can be like that, then you slowly add, because it goes back and goes forth, forward. Yeah. Then as ending for this, um, for this slide, he mentions how uh, when we transmit data, we don't actually, we're not able to transmit data in this manner because of, I think it's mentioned like stack versus queue. So one of it is you, you um, enter from one side and exit the other side. Then one of it is you, you pull from the top in and out. So because you say this one is diff, um, in, a, in a stack, right? It says that this method of transformation requires it to be transmitted in a stack format. Uh, and it's not similar to what most computing systems or manner use it currently. So therefore, uh, when it was discovered, it was not actually utilized. And then the next part will show how uh, it was actually utilized in other subsequent parts. Yeah. I guess I'll pass the time over to Song Kai. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, guys. So, just now, what, uh, just like what David has mentioned. So, when we look at the beast back coding, so essentially we are having, uh, we are taking out a bit of information, use it to do some encoding and decoding, and put back a bit of more information. So essentially, we are doing it in a stack manner. And if we look at the history of the beast back coding, so the beast back coding comes out in the nineties, and in nineteen ninety six, so we are having the first. Uh, attempt in the implementation with the arithmetic coding. So if you know arithmetic coding, it is actually done in the Q, uh, yeah, in a manner of the Q implementation. So it is actually not very compatible with the BISPAC coding. So I think during the implementation, you have to um, break up something as well as you are going to incur quite a bit of overheads. That's why it, it is said by in the slide here that uh, the arithmetic coding does not uh, fit very naturally with the BISPAT implementation. And next, in 2009, we are having another uh, asymmetric numeral systems. Uh, so the asymmetric, uh, asymmetric numeral system is actually implemented in the stack manner. So it actually is very compatible in a good way with the BISPAT coding. So in this page, essentially, uh, in the abstract, it's just saying that um, with the implementation of just one BAE, um, they are able to achieve uh, exceptional, exceptional performance as compared to the previous uh, versions. Uh, but inside this paper, they are also having a bit of concerns. So one of the concerns is uh, actually for the, for the ANS, uh, what they do is they try to encode a sequence of B string um, by a natural number. So they are a bit worried about the precision approximation because we are always using a log likelihood of one over P. Um, but, but with a natural number, we are always, uh, uh, there are a certain issue with the precisions. So um, in the actual video, they, they do not give a very good solution, but they are just saying that if we use a higher base number, so likely we can be close enough. And the second point is that there is a certain inefficiency in encoding the first data point. So as what we can see just now from the bits by coding, so we always need a bit of the initial source as a fuel to the subsequent samplings. Uh, here he mentions that hopefully we can amortize it well. So my understanding is that if we, if we are doing um, bits by coding on a long stream of the bit, so if you think about it, we try to average the initial offset, the overhead over all the bits. So in a way, the overhead is going to become very small. So we kind of amortize it. <clears throat> and we also have two other concerns, which will be discussed in detail in the next slides. 
So the first one is that the VAE is using continuous latent variables and the probabilities are also continuous. So the idea here is uh, we can try to discretize the continuous distribution. So what we have here is, uh, instead of having the continuous distribution, we try to discretize it as, uh, what I see is like all the very small uh, rectangles. So in these rectangles, we are having, uh, we are having an interval as well as a height, or we can call it as a density. So in this way, in, uh, instead of saying that it is a probability, we can say that it is the density times the interval. So it's gonna be the prob uh, probability mass as well. So for this part, we can actually uh, apply this um, to, we can apply this to the evidence lower bound. So originally what we have is, What we have here is the negative log likelihood of p x given i times p i over q i given x. So what we are doing here is just um, make the replacement from the p i into into the interval and and its uh, density. And similarly, we do the same thing for q as well. So it becomes q i x times the interval, sorry. So the good thing we can notice is that we can actually cancel the interval here. Um, so uh, I guess one of the things we need to take note is that when we do the discretization, we have to make sure that we are using the same level of discretization for, for both P and Q. And the next concern is uh, if the bits are clean. So by clean, I think it means that uh, if we are actually drawing the samples from the truly random data. Uh, so by assumption, if we are um, if we are drawing the data from P itself, we can actually achieve, achieve the true random. But if when we are trying to draw data from P, but actually we are drawing samples from Q, there might be some issues. Uh, but what he highlighted is that uh, the essential thing would, would be for us to try to approximate Q so that it is as close to P as possible. So he also highlighted to us that the, one of the objective of the VAE would be the KL divergence, which uh, is aiming to uh, minimize the differences between Q and P. So in his words, so now the now our version of solution is not perfect, but uh, is likely good enough. And we can actually see from the uh, from the results we have from the experiment. So for the first part, uh, what I want to highlight is the difference, the difference between the VAE elbow as well as the uh, BSPAC A and S. So what they want to say is that uh, without the actual P, we can, we can still achieve a very similar performance. So for the finalized minutes, we're having the same performance for this two. And for the full minutes, we're actually only having a very tiny difference of 0 0.02. And in the second half of the data, what they want to do is they try to compare the performance of the ANS against the more traditional um, uh, image encoding schemes. So with this, we can do the comparison and see that the performance is actually uh, much better than the traditional schemes. And the next idea is if we can do even better. So what we have is that uh, because we are trying to uh, approximate, uh, approximate P with Q, so that uh, we can get a Q that is uh, as close to P as possible. So actually the quality of the evidence lower bound would affect, would just affect the total performance, the, the total performance of the, 
of the model. So what they say is that um, I'm not very sure it, it is very if it is very uh, justified. So what they say is that the latent variable models with uh, multiple latent layers tend to have a better elbow than a single latent layer. So it means that we can do uh, multiple layers of encoding. And in this way, we are getting a better lower bound. And for the decoding, we're just doing it in a reverse order. So with this idea, uh, with this idea of using um, multiple layers, they have come up with a new idea of bit swap. Uh, for this one, I'm not exactly sure about the details, but I'll try to um, uh, give you my own interpretations. So for the a to S, what we have is we are treating the whole information as a whole, and when we do the when we do the initial encoding, what we do is we have to do all the encodings uh, at first, uh, do all the decodings at first, and for by doing all the uh, decodings at first, we require a larger amount of initial bits, and it is only after all the decoding is done that we can proceed to do all the encodings. However, for the bit swap, what they're proposing is uh, as soon as we get a certain part of the data decoded, we can use this information to do the further encoding. So in this way, we do not need uh, as much initial bit as the ANS. So if you do the comparison, the main difference, the main difference, despite the sequence of the decoding and coding, would be the amount of initial bits we have. And as uh, results, experimental results for the comparison, we can see that the result is divided into two categories. The CMA means a cumulative average, and the initial means the amount of bits required for the for decoding the first bit. So as you can see, for the CMAs, the ANS and bit swap are actually quite similar. But for the initial one, you can see the difference of 28 to 24, 41 to 25, and 54 to 26. So this marks the main difference. And actually for the rest of the performance, they are quite similar. Um, this is a result based on the CFAR. And for the next one, we are having the result from the minutes as well. So we are actually having the same kind of observation where the CMAs are quite similar, while the initial, initial number of bits is very different. So in this way, they are claiming that the bit swap might be a better, might be a better mechanism. And next we will be talking about the asymmetric numeral systems because we are saying that it works very well with the feedback coding. So I try to draw some uh, inferences, try to make them uh, link a bit if I can. Yeah. So I'll try to go directly to the examples. Uh, by the way, this guy, uh, Jared Duda invented the ANS yeah, in 2007. So I jump straight to the examples. So let's assume that we are trying to encode a bit stream that consists only of a letter A and B. And we, we say that um, we know the probability of the, these two letters. So the probability of A occurring will be one quarter. And the probability of B appearing would be three quarter. So they total, uh, they will add up to one. So what we do is that we try to assign natural numbers to A and B. So for example, what we can do is uh, for A, we can assign maybe all the numbers that are divisible by four to the set of A. So for A, 0, 4, A, 12, 16, etc., And B is gonna be the rest of the numbers, maybe one, two, three, five, six, seven, And as you can see here, uh, in addition to the categorizing the natural numbers into sets, we are also assigning a certain state number for both A and B. So we can see that the zero number, uh, zero number for A would be zero, 
and the first number, the first state of A will be four. And similarly, maybe, maybe the third state of B will be five. So I think um, it would be easier if I try to rearrange, rearrange the numbers by state. So, so maybe we have um, from zero to six. So for the A, because all the numbers are divisible by four. And for B, we are having the rest of the numbers. One, two, three, five, six, seven, and eight belongs to A. And so we are having nine here. So maybe let's assume that we are trying to encode a B sequence of A, B, B. Mm, then we'll um, first, we can start, actually we can start from any of the state. So let's say we start from the state of one. So at state one, we can see that for A, the number will be four. And after we choose four, we will use this information four to go to state four. And we see that on state four, the B has a number of six. So we are having six here for the second B. And upon choosing six, we go to state six, and we will go to, we have the nine here for B. So, so after the, these steps, we're having the sequence of number. But actually during the transmission, what we need to have is actually just one and nine. One is the initial state that we start, and nine is the final number, because if we have nine, we will know that, um, we will know that it is from state six. So we know that the previous number would be six, and six corresponds to the B. And then we also know that the six is at state four, and we'll go back to state four and realize that it is A, and we realize that the four is on state one, so we have reached the termination point. So the information would be A, B, B in the reverse order. So in a way, as, um, in a way, uh, it's just by random. We can actually choose any of the stage. But I think there might be some issue if we choose the state zero, because if we choose state zero, we do not know how many A's are appended at the beginning. But if you have nine, that's a different, uh, I mean, you reverse engineering because what you know is that you can start from state one. Sorry? Um, if, you, if you just transmit nine, right, mm. then you can recover everything else before it, right? Yes. Do you still need to transmit if you started at state one so that you know that you have to end there? Yes, okay. I, I need to do that. If not, maybe at, at, at one, I will need to add another B. So in this way, what I, what I understand is for the b coding, we are having some initial information used for the decoding and coding. So this is actually just the one, the initial state one that is required. And in the process, we are having four and six. We get this number from the starting information one and we try to do it for some further processing, but in the end, we use it, right, take it out and do some processing, put it back. But in the end, we did not transmit it. So it's actually quite similar to the bits back coding where we have the information that goes out and in. And the last one night would be, would just be the actual information that we need to transmit. Yeah, so this is the main idea of the asymmetric numeral systems. Uh, in the actual implementation, they may not be using um, this kind of uh, simple way of uh, dividing the numbers into like divisible by four and the rest of the numbers. They are having some different uh, uh, numbering schemes, but I think this will capture the main idea quite clearly. Uh, and next, uh, the, the lecture is trying to give an intuition of the performance of the scheme. So, as you can see here, so if we are at um, state one and we are looking at the letter A, so after we encode A, we'll go directly from like the state one to state four. So the natural number is increased by four times. Actually, in another sense, you can think about it as because the frequency, the probability of A occurring is one over four. 
So essentially, we are having the original number, which is the initial state of one, divided by the probability of it occurring. So it's one divided by one over four, so it becomes four. And similarly, you can see as well for B. So in a sense, we are, whenever we encounter a B, we are actually uh, divide the number, divide the natural number by a factor of three quarter. So in this sense, So in this sense, whenever we try to encode one bit, we are dividing it by, uh, by the probability of it occurring. Uh, if we are uh, decoding a, a bit string, so what we have is for the initial stage, we are dividing it by the probability of the first bit, the second bit, so on until the last bit. So this is, um, a rough uh, approximation of the, uh, of the performance we have. So if we try to convert it into the form of the entropy, so in order to uh, send a log, uh, a log number of bits, so what we have is we try to do some manipulation, we will realize that we are having um, this log likelihood of one over b here with a bit of constant. So uh, what I say is that is this scheme is actually quite optimized. Yes, that will be all for me. Thanks, Okai. Okay, so uh, we end early today. What a, what a treat. <laughs> Instead of driving until I think 8.39. Um, so uh, we have 15 minutes, so it's actually a good time for you guys to discuss projects among yourselves, right? I think. Next week, uh, lecture six is quite connected to this week's uh, lecture, right? So um, uh, we will have a continuation, of, I think, of, of some of the lecture and we'll, we'll start on the GAN parts, right? So the GAN lecture is really long. So I, I heard lots of people squawking about that already. So that, that'll be quite fun. Um, in any case, uh, that's all for tonight. So uh, uh, those of you who are participating by remote, there are a couple of you. Do you guys have any questions? Let's just check whether anyone's here. So Joni and, uh, well, just Joni Xiaoyang is not here, right? You guys are on mute, so um, if you have anything to say, say. Um, can we clarify a little bit on the project's uh, timeline and how do we join teams again? I think you, you wanted that. to clarify on the project timeline? Can you speak up a little bit? We can barely hear you. Yeah, can, can you clarify a bit on project timeline and how do we form groups again? Uh, okay, to form groups, uh, what you need to do is uh, just talk with other people in the class. Um, they're all unfortunately, or fortunately here, um, not online. So if, if you want to uh, uh, go to the project channel in Slack and then uh, you know, uh, see who else is uh, interested. I think some people have mentioned their projects on projects or on the data channel. I think a couple of people you uh, have discussed uh, that. So uh, that might be a first way to do it. Um, yeah, so uh, that was the first part. What was the second half of your question, Joni? Yeah, I think you actually covered it. I was asking, well, like, have people posted their project ideas and which flow would that be in? I haven't okay. seen anything on the project flow. This? Yeah, so if you guys uh, are here um, and you can spare a couple seconds, maybe even if you have a notional project, uh, you can just uh, discuss it either on the general channel or the project channel. I mean, there's not so many of us here. We don't overwhelm the Slack, right? So it's okay. Yeah. So Joni uh, uh, and uh, Xiaoyang, if you want to uh, participate in uh, the discussion, you just uh, help yourself on Slack. Uh, and then I think that those of us who are here will be happy to reply, okay? So again, the, the project, uh, just the title, uh, I think just the title uh, is due uh, next week. So it's also indicative, meaning you can change it. It's uh, perfectly fine to do that, okay? All right, uh, if nothing else, uh, I'm gonna stop the recording and we'll finish today. So those of you who are here, welcome to talk for a while longer, okay? Uh, I will be going around and asking you again about your projects, okay?
Uh, where do you submit it? Um, uh, okay, good question. So let me show you where. If you go back to our original sheet, um, this one here, there is ta -da, a column for project title. So um, you can edit that one uh, with your information. So if you have more than one member of the group, you can just copy and paste, okay? Um, and, and that's how I know that you, you have uh, come out with a project title. Later on, uh, you'll be asked to submit your project abstract into the STEPS system. That will be a couple weeks from now. Um, and that, again, you can change all the way up, up until week 12, okay? So for some of these uh, projects, you may be able to find a GitHub repo that are actually implements uh, the algorithm that you want to try. So I would suggest that you try to get um, the repo running, replicate the experiments that uh, the researchers have done on that, and then see whether, uh, you know, um, after week eight or nine, see whether you can adapt it to use your data. But the first thing is to make sure that the whatever deep uh, unsupervised learning algorithm you choose. One is, do you have to implement it? Hopefully not, <laughs> okay. But if you do, great, then that's more work for you. Um, and then any type of implementation that would be uh, sufficient for the project. If you already have an implement, if there's already an implementation and you're trying to fit it to a new data set, uh, then the first thing you need to do is replicate and make sure that uh, that particular repo actually uh, with the data that's provided actually converges, right? So sometimes it doesn't converge. So uh, you wanna make sure that uh, what, what people have advertised actually work, okay? And then after that, try to adapt it to the data set or things that you want, okay? So what's the final deliverable? The final deliverable is uh, as the steps presentation that will be in week 13. So you need to create a poster the poster has to have scientific content, so you have to have all the experiments that you've done and introduce properly introduce the, the algorithm you're using, give credit uh, by referencing whichever websites or uh, GitHub repos that you uh, use. Or in the case where you're writing it yourself, then you know, hopefully you're willing to open source that and, and be taking all the uh, uh, bullets and arrows thrown your way when your, your thing doesn't converge, right? Yeah. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions about projects? Okay, this course is really, really simple. I mean, it's SU, it's not for grades or anything. I couldn't grade it even if I wanted to because I don't understand the material anyways. Okay, but um, you know, uh, as I told you already, you know, this is just so that all of us can study together. Okay, so um, if we are able to do a project, uh, again, as I told you earlier, if you want to take one of the projects that are a homework assignment from the Berkeley class, or you can go to the Stanford site, because Stanford also ran this course, right? So uh, I've told many lecturers, you can go to the Stanford uh, slides and see whether they're any good. Okay, so if Stanford has a, a set of homeworks or, or project ideas, you can copy those too. Plagiarism with credit is okay, all right? So must credit, okay. All right, so that's it for tonight, okay? so. Please talk among yourselves, use the room until, uh, yeah, for the next 10 minutes or so.